Amen. You may be seated. I do invite you to turn this morning to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, we're going to be reading from the fourth chapter. As you're doing that, may I apologize that we did miss that announcement this week regarding our discipleship class. I'm just going to give you another live plug for that. We are going to be dealing with the nuts and bolts of how we seek to do missions here at IBC. So I really want to encourage all of you, our church members particularly, of course, you don't have to be a church member to attend the discipleship class, but to make every effort to be at the class next week. We will be getting Sunday school for the children. There will be also uh, a high school class as well. But for IBC members, especially as we're looking, Lord willing, to soon launch uh, Kyle and Hannah to the mission field in South Africa and Bible Translation Fellowship, you will want to be here, I trust, to understand how we are going to be doing missions as a church moving forward, um, the nuts and bolts of it. The basic framework will be 20, 25 minutes of teaching, 20, 25 minutes of discussion. So we are going to make it a live interactive, interactive time. Um, so I want to encourage you and really press upon you. Uh, I know we've been rather complacent on our Lord's Days for two, nearly 18 months, and uh, the thought of going to the gym doesn't always appeal to me either. But let's stand up and let's really engage, Lord willing, next week as we restart uh, our discipleship class. I think you'll be edified and encouraged as we walk through some important ma material together. And as we pray and as we get ready, uh, Lord willing, to launch Kyle and Hannah. So I really want to encourage you to make the effort next Lord's Day to join with us as we restart our discipleship class. We're going to read together the Word of God, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let's read from the 44th verse, and then we will read into chapter 5 as we come to God's Word this morning. Deuteronomy 4, commencing at verse 44. This is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statutes, and the rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt beyond the Jordan, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt. And they took possession of his land and the land of Og, the king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites who lived to the east beyond the Jordan, from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, as far as Mount Sirion, that is Hermon, together with all the Arabah on the east side of the Jordan, as far as the sea of the Arabah, under the slopes of Pisgah. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, no, do not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates.' 
that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to you, to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us His glory and greatness, and we have heard His voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say. And speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you. And we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to me. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents, but you stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess." Amen. So reads God's Word. Let's pray and ask His help as we come to His Word this morning. Our great God in heaven, You are the Ancient of Days, the Sovereign God of all creation, and the God who is at work, working out His eternal purpose in creation. We come to You this morning as Your creatures, acknowledging that not only are You our Creator, but we bless you and we praise you that you are our Savior. You do not deal with us as our sins deserve. Indeed, we believe that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from us because of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whom we trust. We pray now, Father, as we come to you, that you would draw near to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for what it teaches us about you and what we are to believe regarding you, and what you require of us. We pray now, as we would take it up, that you would speak, and that we would hear, and that we would be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit as we look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Come, O God, we pray to this place now we ask, and transform us by your grace for Jesus' sake. Amen. Mystery of Redemption is marked by many events, both great and small. When it comes to the big events especially, thanks to Sunday school for many of us, or godly parenting for many of us, we know them from our childhood. And maybe those of you here this, this morning who have never been at Sunday school, never grown up in the church, never had godly parents, and it's possible then, if you've come to faith in Christ, that you can often feel, I just don't know the Bible too well. 
And that is to be expected. And yet, you need to realize that you've come into something that is far bigger than you, and far more wonderful than you will ever understand, and that is marked by some significant events that you do need to know and you do need to understand. When you read the Word of God, you discover that the fall in Genesis 3 is a big event. You move through to Genesis 6, and you discover that there was a global flood that was a big event. You then move into the story of the Exodus, and you come to understand that, again, this was a big event. So, too, was the giving of the law of God, the conquest of Canaan, the rise of the kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon, then the Babylonian captivity that took the kingdom of Judah away after the kingdom of of Israel had been taken by the Assyrians. But of course, the biggest event in the whole of the Word of God is the coming of God Himself into the world in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The life and death and resurrection and ascension to glory of Jesus Christ is the biggest event in the whole of history. And in the Word of God. However, what can often be missing in our understanding of the reading of these big events is our understanding of what they mean. What is it that is significant about the fall? What is it that is significant about the flood? What about the exodus or the giving of the law? Especially when it comes to the Old Testament, I think it's fair to say that many of us read it and then wonder, so what? What's the implication? What's the relevance? Why do we need to understand this? Why is it here? What I want to say to you this morning as we return to the book of Deuteronomy is this, that all of your Bible, all of Scripture is Christian Scripture. And you must come to it not as if you are a Jew who is living before Christ, but as a Christian who is living under Christ, so that you might understand that from Genesis to Revelation, what you are reading is what God intended for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean automatically you're going to understand how to join all the dots. That's why church matters. That's why preaching is important. That's why discipleship classes are helpful, so that we might grow in our knowledge of God and our understanding of God and His Word in its totality. All of Scripture, however, we must understand is Christian Scripture. So, as we come to it, we come to it as Christians. And so, here again, as we take up the book of Deuteronomy this morning, we're taking it up as Christians. But we are reading of ancient history, and we are going to wrestle with its relevance to us as Christians in the 21st century as we read of these primitive, more primitive times in God's purpose of redemption. What we're considering in Deuteronomy is what happened in God's purpose long before Christ came into the world. That which happened in God's purpose by way, and this is very important to understand, by way of preparation, by way of getting ready for the big event. We're reading that which was to be temporary, not abiding with regards to God's purpose in Jesus Christ. And the chapter before us this morning begins Moses' second address to Israel as the nation is camped out on the plains of Moab, anticipating entering Canaan to settle the land in fulfillment to God's promise to Abraham. And the content of this address forms the heart of the book of Deuteronomy. What we have here starting in Deuteronomy 5 is going to run all the way to Deuteronomy 26. That's a substantial part of the book. 
substantial part of God's revelation to us. And as we launch into it this morning, what I want you to simply see is this, that we are looking here at Israel's renewing covenant with God. And as we look at Israel's renewing covenant with God, I want us to think about then how God relates to man and how relevant this is for us, not as old covenant Israel, but as the new covenant church. And I'm going to hopefully draw some lines for you to help you to see the connections, the continuities, as well as the discontinuities, because both have to be understood if we're going to grasp the revelation of God. So, we're going to think about Israel's renewing covenant with God this morning, and we're going to consider this passage under three main points. We're going to consider the introduction to Israel's renewing covenant with God, We're going to look at the center of Israel's renewing covenant with God, and we'll then consider the outworking of Israel's renewing covenant with God. The introduction, the center, and the outworking of Israel's renewing covenant with God. And see then how it relates to us as Christians who have been given this revelation by God to teach us about God and how we through Christ are to relate to God. So, come with me first of all into chapter 444 through chapter 5, verse 6, and let's consider briefly the introduction to Israel's renewing covenant with God. In verse 44 of chapter 4, Moses summarizes what is coming for us in this sermon. This is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. The testimonies, the statutes, and the rules. That is to say, the Ten Commandments and the various applications of it for the corporate life of the nation. There are two key aspects here I want you to see. Notice the historical reminder. Moses reminds his audience of the historical context in which God covenanted with Israel initially. Notice he says, when they came out of Egypt, beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, they find themselves in this situation where they have taken a couple of cities, where they're preparing now to cross over into Canaan, where God has reminded them of the dangers of unbelief and has encouraged them with some victories. We see here the historical reminder that Moses gives to Israel of God's dealings with them. Brothers and sisters, it's very important for us to realize that God's people have a history. And may I say, history matters. Boys and girls, listen to me. You may be good at math like Mr. uh, Mr. Granados, right? You may be good at English like my daughter, but be good at history because history matters, especially redemptive history. That is the history of God dealing with sinful mankind in grace. God's people have a history. History matters to God's people. Why? Because it is a record of God's providential dealings with His people. And in seeking to set the context for Israel's covenant renewal in the plains of Moab, Moses reminds them of God's dealings with them in the past. God has brought them out of Exodus, out of Egypt by way of the Exodus. God has brought them through victories over a couple of these nations with strange names. Now they are anticipating entering into the land. But before they do, God's servant is bringing to them His Word to guide them and direct them once they get into the land. There is the historical reminder. But notice, secondly, there is the contemporary emphasis. We have that in verses 1 through 6 as we move into chapter 5. The contemporary emphasis. Moses summons the people before him, and he declares to them, Hear, O Israel, listen something we do well to when there's a sermon being preached. Pay attention. Give heed. Hear. Use your ears. Listen to the Word of God. 
the statutes, the rules that I speak in your hearing today. Why? Just for entertainment? No. Hear these things that you will learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. Now, notice, first of all, the purpose of his declaration here as we look at this contemporary emphasis. The purpose of his declaration is that they would heed what he is saying. Good preaching wants the hearers to get it. Good preaching wants the hearers to hear so that they will believe and they will do what God says. And we see this is the purpose for which, Israel, for which Moses is speaking to Israel, that they would hear the Word, that they would believe the Word, that they would put it into practice in their lives. Notice the character of this declaration. Verses 2 and 3, he reminds them of the covenant character of God. And look at what he wants them to reflect upon. A very interesting, somewhat controversial statement. The Lord God made a covenant with us in Horeb, not with our fathers. Now, if you're thinking at all, you've got to say, hold on a wee minute. <laughs> but he did make this covenant with their fathers. How are we to understand this statement? What is Moses saying? Well, we know two things for sure. The generation before Moses uh, before, he, before this generation, uh, was the generation that actually stood at the mountain and heard the voice of God. So, he, whatever he means, he doesn't mean that they didn't make a covenant with their fathers, because Moses would be lying, and we know he's not lying, so we've got to realize he's not saying they didn't make a covenant. What is he, what is he saying? We also know that Moses is concerned to instruct the generation now before him as they go into the land. One commentator suggests this, that what we really have in this statement is, not only with our fathers did God make a covenant, but that covenant was made with the whole nation for perpetual generations to come, and therefore has a living and contemporary relevance for you, just as it did for your parents, and will have a contemporary relevance for the next generation. I think that is what Moses is actually communicating here to the people. He's reminding them of the fact that they are part of something bigger than themselves, He's reminding them that they are part of the covenant community of God and the co covenant responsibilities that were made with their fathers now pass on to them as the covenant people of God. And notice the manner of the communication in verses 4 and 5. They actually heard the voice of God declare the Ten Commandments. Now, I know we live in a very interesting confused age where people are going to tell you they've heard the voice of God, right? You will only hear the voice of God today in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. If anybody tells you they've heard the voice of God outside of the Bible, they are not telling the truth. Now, they may genuinely have thought they've heard the voice of God, but they haven't. But here, God actually verbally spoke in a way that the people could hear. This is supernatural. This is revelation from God that is direct. And we see here that it is the Ten Commandments that are spoken, and then after that, Moses will then mediate to the people all the rules, testimonies, and statutes of application. But the ten words are verbalized by God and the people hear it, and the people speak of it, and the people are caused to be fearful in the face of it. Whilst there is a covenant that was established with Israel in the past, it is a covenant with abiding authority in the present for the generation sitting before Moses as he preaches here to them. And brothers and sisters, what I want you to see here as we think of this introduction to Israel's covenant renewal is to understand that what we see here is how God works in terms of His covenant relationship with mankind. How God works. Throughout redemptive history, God establishes a covenant 
with mankind in time. And he sets boundaries to his covenant and stipulations with his covenant. And he continue, and that covenant, whichever one it is, continues to have binding authority for generations to come until God then establishes a different covenant. And this is what you see in your Bible. If you start reading your Bible in Genesis 1 and start walking through your Bible, what will you see? You'll see, first of all, and Pastor Steve was dealing with this recently at prayer meeting, God makes a covenant with man in the garden. It's called the covenant of works, right? Or the covenant of life is how our, our, our catechism described it, right? But nevertheless, it is a covenant. And how does that happen? God comes and he speaks to man and he gives man stipulations for relating to God. And then what do you discover? You discover as you continue to walk through history that God continues to come again and again to mankind. He comes and makes a covenant with Noah. You have that there in, in Genesis 7, 8, and 9. And then what do you discover? You discover he comes and he makes a covenant with Abraham. And he renews that covenant with Isaac and with Jacob, right? And then what do you dis discover? You discover he makes this covenant with Jacob's descendants, Israel, through Moses. This is the covenant we're talking about in Deuteronomy. He will also make a covenant with David, Right? And what you discover is that God comes and he, he speaks and He reveals His truth to mankind to enter into relationship with man through covenant. And the ultimate, final, glorious, eternal, everlasting covenant that we have in our Bible is the one that Jesus Christ established through His life, death, and resurrection described as the new covenant, called in theological terms the covenant of grace. Now, all these covenants are not identical to one another. They all have different elements to them. We don't have time to get into all that this morning. All I want you to simply see from this introduction to God renewing covenant with Israel is how God works in terms of His covenant relationship with man. God initiates. God reveals. God stipulates. God comes to man and calls man to believe, calls man to embrace what God is saying. With regard to this Mosaic covenant, we have to understand that it's not like the covenant that he makes with Christ and us. Jeremiah, and Jeremiah 31 actually will make it very clear that, that a new covenant will be made not like the covenant made with Israel. Now, what is the distinctive difference? Well, I would argue that this covenant, the Deuteronomy passage and the Exodus passages, this is a covenant of works. A covenant of works that says, do this and live fail to do it, and die. And you notice as we walk through the passage, what is it tied to? It's tied to the blessing of God in the land of Canaan. And so what is God doing here? He's entering into covenant with Israel to direct and instruct them on how to live for Him in the land of Canaan. But here's the important point to understand. It was never meant to be permanent. It was always meant to be preparatory. Why? Because something else is attached to this covenant. It is a promise. It is a promise that was first heard in Genesis 3.15 when God told the devil that he would not ultimately win. Remember what happened in Gen Genesis 3.15? You will bruise the seed of the woman's heel, but he will crush your head. That is what John Calvin calls the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel promise, speaking of what God's purpose would be in the world immediately after the devil had tempted our first parents and brought the curse and brought the judgment of God down upon the world, that God would save, that God would redeem, notwithstanding the powers of darkness. And then when we get to Genesis 12 and, and the life of Abraham, we see this promise again spoken of in this sense, that the seed of Abraham, 
who is to be the seed of the woman, would become a blessing to all the nations, to all the nations of the world. Every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, the seed of Abraham would become a blessing. The promise was that God would yet save from destruction through His promised seed of Abraham. So, when we come to Deuteronomy, when we come into the, the, the purpose of God as He's establishing Israel, yes, we have this covenant of law, but we also have this attached promise that will find fulfillment in the covenant of grace in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And what God does here is He, he, he protects, if you will, His covenants, his, his promise rather, through the nation of Israel until what? The fullness of time had come. And it was time to fulfill the promise by God Himself stepping into the world in the person and work of His Son. So, when we come to this passage and we think about it, we must think about it in the big picture that God works by way of covenant relationship with man, and some of His covenants are covenants of works, and then there is a covenant of grace, which is the new covenant. And what we must see here, that as we look at Deuteronomy, we're looking at something preparatory, we're looking at something that protects the promise, and we're looking at that which is not like the covenant that he will make with Christ. Very important. Why? Because you could end up thinking, as many have done, that you can be justified before God by the works of the law. And that would be a disaster. Because you know what that will do? That will take you to hell. There is no justification before God by the works of the law. There is only justification before God by the work of Jesus Christ as you trust in Him. Yet, as we look at this, we must understand that the law is given by God because of sin and because He wants to preserve His promise and because He wants to fulfill His purpose in His Son. And as we look at this covenant, we must look at it through the lens of realizing it will be fulfilled in Jesus. It will find its fulfillment in Christ. We are not under this covenant. We are under a better covenant. And we're going to see that as we tease it out. So that's by way of introducing, introduction. Look at, secondly, the center of Israel's renewing covenant with God. The center of it. Because what we have in verses 6 to 22 is the center of God's renewing covenant with God. And you'll be glad to know that we are not going to launch in right now to an exposition of the Ten Commandments. Right? Very tempting for some guys to say, well, we'll just park the bus now, and for the next 20 weeks, we'll spend time in the Ten Commandments. We're not doing that. And maybe some of you will say hallelujah. But the reality is, we do have to see what is at the center of God's renewing covenant with Israel. It is the moral law, the Ten Commandments. He recalls the Ten Commandments. He recalls the moral law. Now, notwithstanding the fact we're not going to expound it all, let me just say to you that there are three observations I want you to see here regarding the Ten Commandments from our passage. First of all, what we have in the Ten Commandments is God's self-disclosure. God's self-disclosure. What do I mean by God's self-disclosure? Well, from the creation of our first parent, Adam, God in His great condescension, right? God is unknowable unless God reveals Himself to us. I hope you realize that, right? God cannot be known savingly unless God Himself comes and, and reveals Himself to us, right? Yes, it's true that as those who are created in His image, we have a, le a level of natural knowledge of God. That's true. Romans 1 is clear on that. Of course, it's marred by the fall. But what we need to understand is this. God, in His great condescension, makes Himself known to us through His own chosen self-disclosure, right? It's God tells us what He wants us to know about Him. He hasn't left us in ignorance. And if you think that you can know God in His essence, apart from what He chooses to reveal to you, you've not actually understood who God actually is. God is higher than we can grasp, greater than we can comprehend, beyond our finite ability to know who He really, truly is. However, 
he does choose to disclose himself. And this is wonderful. He does choose to reveal himself. What God did at Sinai and what Israel renews here on the plains of Moab, centering upon the Ten Commandments, is that God is again coming in self-disclosure to his people. And what is he showing them? I am holy. I am holy. And as such, you need to relate to me as being holy. Notice, secondly, it is here that God reveals what he wants us to believe about him and what he requires of us as his creatures. I am the Lord, your God. I am Yahweh, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. In verse 6, he reminds Israel of what he has done. He's brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's true that they have received the grace of God by way of physical redemption. But remember, that physical redemption is a picture of spiritual redemption, and not everybody who was physically brought out of Egypt was a true believer in the living God. He is their Redeemer for, from bondage. He is their Savior from slavery. He is their, delivery from, their deliverer, deliverer from Egypt. He is a loving and caring God, and He wants them to remember that as he comes and brings his self-disclosure to them. And that's what we need to see. We need to understand this. Right? As God is renewing covenant with Israel on the plains of Moab, he's reminding them of his love and of his care for them. He's reminding them of his holiness towards them. To what end? That they would trust him. That they would rest in him. That they would live for him. And so we see, thirdly, at the center of God's covenant relationship with Israel is what? Is the character and purpose of God. The character and purpose of God. He makes it clear that He alone is God, that He alone saves, that He is the only one who saves. That all the false gods of the Moabites and the Amorites and all the rest of them, they're they're not true gods. And that he alone is the true and the living God. And that he is worthy to be loved. That he is worthy to be trusted. How amazing. In ten simple words, God discloses his character for us to behold. That we might trust him. That we might love him. You see, what we see here as we look at the center of Israel's renewing covenant with God is this. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, play a role in every covenant administration of God. They play a role in every covenant administration of God. Adam was created with the work of the law written upon his heart. So are we, right? That's why we have a conscience. That's why when you say to someone something like this, you should not tell a lie. Even though they may deny it to your face, there's a bell going off in their conscience. They know that's true. Why? Because God has put the work of the law upon their heart. That's why when you have a little one and you tell them no, and they go ahead and say yes, there's a conflict arises because their conscience has on it this, these words, honor your mother and your father, right? Man is not an animal. Man is an image bearer of the holy, sovereign, almighty God of heaven and earth. And that God has disclosed himself to us And one way he has done that is by putting the work of the law upon our hearts. He did it with our first parents. He does it with all of us. God's covenant with with Adam was designed to test Adam's willingness to live faithfully to God. Now, you know the rest of the story, and you're living with the consequences of it, right? He failed, so we failed. So we all fell into this catastrophic mess called this fallen world. But nevertheless, we must be clear that God's law played a role in the garden. 
But notice also, as you go through history, redemptive history, God's law continues to reappear and reappear until we get to Sinai and here on the plains of Moab, where God actually has told us what it contains, right? Summed up, really, in how we relate to God and how we relate to each other. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the danger is, as many have made the mistake of thinking, well, if I just keep the law then, that will get me right with God. That's a fatal mistake, first of all, because in Adam, you're already guilty and condemned. But secondly, you haven't kept the law, and you can never keep the law because of sin. And if you try to get right with God by keeping His law, you will utterly fail. And so, I want to say to you this morning, if you're here and you're not a Christian, it's very important that you understand the Christian life is not do better. It's not keep the law. It's not get right with God by being a good person. That's not the gospel. The gospel teaches you, first of all, that you've broke the law, and you're guilty before God. And there is nothing you can do to get yourself out of your predicament. Guilty as charged, and continually being guilty as you continually fall short of the standard of God's holiness, His glorious law. Right? It's very important you understand this. See, well, what hope is there? The hope is that God Himself has come in the person of Jesus and fulfilled the law on your behalf, that as you believe in Jesus, you will be declared righteous by God because of His life and pardoned by God for your transgression of the law through His death. You see, Jesus died in order to satisfy God's just requirements regarding His law. And what is that? The soul that sins, the soul that transgresses the law, shall die, deserves to be punished. But God punished Christ on the cross so that whosoever believes in Christ and His life and death and resurrection should not perish but have everlasting life. So, the wonderful hope of the gospel this morning is this. You as a lawbreaker can be pardoned and made right with God by the law keeper and the sacrifice for sin, who is Jesus Christ. And so, you will then trust in Him and Him alone for your pardon, for your standing with God. Now, what happens when we become believers? We are born again of the Spirit of God. God Himself and the power of the Spirit, the person of the Spirit, comes to dwell in our hearts. And what does He do? He writes the law of God on our hearts in a new and gracious way. We become new creation. And in becoming new creation, He takes out our hearts of stone, and He gives us hearts of flesh, that say this, Oh Lord, I love your law. Not as the grounds of my justification, for that is Christ and Christ alone, but rather as a means to my sanctification that I might live for you and glorify you as I strive then to be a faithful child. Now, we're living in a time when far too many Christians don't understand the role of the law in their Christian life. And they never study to understand it. We have a cheap grace Christian culture that the minute you would mention law, you get accused of being a legalist. Well, I've just explained to you that we don't believe that you can be justified by the law. We believe you're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But it doesn't mean the law has no relevance for your life. The law is that which God uses to convict your conscience. The law is that which God has written upon your heart to guide your life. The law is that which helps you to define what sin is. 
Not as a means to you being justified, but as a means to you being sanctified. Being brought to be like Jesus Christ. And my dear brothers and sisters, it's so important to understand this as we look at this. Why? Because when you read Jeremiah 31, you discover that the law has been written upon our hearts as new creations, and therefore in Christ we shall have a love and an interest in the law to guide us in our lives to live for the glory of God. And at the very center then of our covenant relationship with God, founded upon Christ and Christ alone, is our desire then for what? To love God with all our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbor as ourselves, and even to love our enemies. And that's why our church covenant is worded the way it is so that we might be able to delineate clearly what it means to be in Christ, what it means to live for the glory of God by obedience to the law of God. So I would just want to say this to you this morning. If you have an aversion to the law of God, consider that your theology may be confused and messed up. Beware of the conflation of justification and sanctification that many today are falling into. It's all about justification. No, it's not all about justification. It's all about sanctification. No, it's not all about sanctification. It's all about adoption. No, it's not. It's all about union with Christ, which brings to us three blessings, justification, sanctification, and adoption. Union with Christ is the glorious blessing of the new covenant that God bestows upon us. If you don't believe me, go home this afternoon and just read through your New Testament. And every time you see the phrase in Paul's letters, in Christ, remind yourself, wow, union with Christ, union with Christ. There it is. That's the center of our covenant life with God. But it doesn't negate the place of the Ten Commandments in our life. The center for us is union with Christ that brings about the writing of the law of God upon our hearts. Now, what does that mean for our Christian lives? Well, that brings us to the third and final thing. The outworking of Israel's renewing covenant with God. The outworking of Israel's renewing covenant with God. We have this in 20, 22 through 33, and we need to rush quickly through this. There are three observations I want you to see here. Notice Israel's response to God's self-disclosure. Israel's response. Moses reminds them of their experience at Sinai when God spoke the law to them. The people recognized the magnitude of the event in verse 24, and it was an awesome event. It was a terrifying event. It was a glorious event. Some of them, the children, some of them were probably children when it happened 40 years before. But notice, the hearing of God's words accompanied by the power and the glory of God's presence, caused them to realize the holiness of God and their need for a mediator to approach Him. Their need for a mediator. They got to the point, as they heard the law, and as it, as it, as it impacted their conscience, they realized, that's enough. We can't take any more. Moses, you need to intervene here, and, and you need to be the mediator here because, because God is too glorious, and God is too holy, and God is too terrifying as we contemplate His glory for us to simply have no mediator between us. Israel's response to God's self-disclosure and awareness of our need for a mediator. Moses' role in God's self-disclosure to be the mediator, verses 23 to 27. Moses functions after Sinai as what? God's mouthpiece, the prophet to the nation, the first prophet of many prophets, and the foreshadowing of what? The ultimate prophet, Jesus Christ himself, God himself coming veiled in flesh to speak the ultimate final word of God to the nation. And God's intention in His self-disclosure, verses 28 through 33. What is it? Well, I think it's a beautiful text for us to meditate on as we would close our time together. Notice what He says. 
Verse 29, oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. God's intention in his self-disclosure, that the people would trust him and that the people would serve him and that the people would live for his glory. I know, my dear brothers and sisters, this is what God in Christ intends for us, isn't it? God in Christ, in disclosing Himself to us in His Son, intends that we would be instructed by Him, that we would live for Him, that we would work out our relationship with Him. You see, how do you encounter God today? You don't encounter God today by a voice coming from heaven. You encounter God today through the person and work of His Son as the Word of God comes to you explaining to you who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how you encounter God. There is no other way for any sinful man, any sinful woman, any sinful boy, any sinful girl to encounter God today on the earth savingly apart from believing in Jesus Christ. And that's the wonderful blessing of grace that is freely offered to us in the gospel. Do you want to know God today? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not about keeping His law. It's about trusting His Son. It's not about obeying Ten Commandments. It's about trusting His Son. God has disclosed Himself down through the centuries. But ultimately and finally and fully, he has done it in Jesus Christ. And if you will trust in Jesus Christ, if you will come to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and peace with God, you shall come to know God for yourself. God's desire is that your heart would be resting in him. And the only way that's possible is if you trust in His Son. Through Christ, we enter into an everlasting covenant, a better covenant than the one that was made with Israel at Sinai. But we learn from Israel's experience, from God's dealings with Israel, what it means to be in covenant with God and how God works. And so this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, realize that the big events of redemptive history, they are important to know and to understand why? Because they're designed to reveal God to us. They're designed to reveal God to us that we might know who God is and what God is like, that we might trust Him through His Son and live for Him through His Son. The renewing of covenant on the plains of Moab by Israel took them and us back to Sinai, yes, but they revealed God in all His holiness and righteousness and power so that they would point, to us, point out to us our need then of trusting in Jesus Christ. These point forward, you see, to a greater day. A day that has come. The day of Christ. We live today, not under the old covenant, but under the new covenant. That is the day that is upon us. That is the day that calls us then into covenant with God, not through keeping His law, but by trusting His Son by believing in Jesus. And when we believe in Jesus, we're in covenant with God. Let's pray. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. We acknowledge that there is much for us to wrestle with regarding your dealings with man, and yet we thank you that even as we think upon your dealings with Israel and days gone by, as they were upon the plains of Moab and as Moses declared your word to them, that these things instruct us about you as a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. We bless you, Father, that we come to you this morning knowing that you are a God of covenant grace in Jesus. We bless you that it is a better covenant that we have because it is a covenant that has been made by your Son, and he has fulfilled all its stipulations for us. And that as we would then trust in Him, 
we would enjoy forgiveness for sins and peace with God. Lord, may we be a people who, having had your law written upon our hearts, be a people who delight in your law according to the inner man and who strive to live according to it, not in our own strength, but in the power that you supply by the work of your Spirit in our hearts, that we would be a people who, believing in Jesus, would love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. That believing in Jesus, we would be a people who seek to love our neighbor as ourselves, and even to love our enemies as you command. Father, draw near to us this morning. Encourage us in the way that leads to heaven. Thank you that you are a God of covenant mercy and covenant grace. Thank you that in Christ we are in covenant with you, and it is a covenant that can never be broken. We bless you for your mercies to us in your Son. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen.